here on the edge of the wilderness, in a new world, far in the dark of a continent, and have a flute to play at evening here, while his strains echo to the stars amid the howling of wolves, shall live, as it were, in the primitive age of the world, a primitive man. Yet he shall spend a sunny day, and in this century be my contemporary. Perchance shall read some scattered leaves of literature, and sometimes talk with me. Why read history then, if the ages and the generations are now? He lives 3,000 years deep in time, an age not yet described by poets. Can you well go further back in history than this? Aye, aye, for there turns up but now a still more ancient and primitive man whose history is not brought down even to the former. In a bark vessel sown with the roots of the spruce, with hornbeam paddles he dips his way along. He is but dim and misty to me, obscured by the eons that lie between the bark canoe and the bateau. He builds no house of logs, but a wigwam of skins. He eats no hot bread and sweet cake, but musquash and moose meat and the fat of bears. He glides up the Millinocket and is lost to my sight as a more distant and misty cloud is seen flitting by beside Anira, behind Anira, and is lost in space. So he goes about his destiny, the red face of man. Connie Baxter Marlowe has spent the last two decades in close association with visionary Native American elders throughout the United States and Mexico. The Hopi, Maya, Tarahumara, Kui, Huichol, Huichol. Huichol. Mm -hmm. Wabanaki, Lakota, Cute, and more recently the Bushmen of the Kalahari in South Africa. She feels that in the cosmology of the indigenous people, are clues to many of the missing pieces of the prevailing paradigm, information about the true nature of the universe. It is her understanding that humanity is about to make an evolutionary leap in consciousness to an understanding of the loving, interconnected, abundant universe. Humanity will align itself to this reality and subsequently choose to bring peace on Earth in our time. Connie and I believe that when we come together with the indigenous peoples as equals, as family, and we each open our hearts and our minds to the other, the melding of our gifts will bring a new perspective that is invisible at this time. To her, this new perspective will allow humanity to see the path to true unity, peace, and freedom. Connie finds da Henry David Thoreau an important bridge to this shift in consciousness. And she has produced a film series called The American Evolution, Voices of America, which weaves a tapestry of paradigm-shifting ideas with a visionary Thoreau scholar, Penobscot Indian elders, a Muslim imam, and other important thinkers addressing these ideas. Connie's book of photographs, Greatest Mountain, Katahdin's Wilderness, is actually out of print, but it is available in uh, several places, including here tonight and at several bookstores in Maine. There is an exhibition of her photographs from the book at the LaMarche Gallery in the Smith Union at Bowdoin College until August 24, with a reception and a special tribute to Percival Baxter on Tuesday, August 21, Tuesday, next Tuesday, from 5 to 6.30. There is also a film screening and seminar of the five-part series, The American Evolution. Voices of America is being shown tomorrow at the Curtis Library in Brunswick.
tomorrow, Saturday, August 18th. Tonight, Andrew Cameron Bailey represents Thoreau. He will and has read excerpts from Thoreau's Indians, the 1,000 Indian-related references in Thoreau's writings, which were compiled by Bradley P. Dean, Ph.D. James Neptune. Is that James Neptune? <laughs> Penobscot, Passamaquoddy descent, director of the Penobscot Tribal Museum, and direct descendant of old John Neptune, the first Wabanaki to climb Mount Katahdin, represents Joe Polis, Thoreau's Indian guide. Also reading from Thoreau's Indians. According to Ralph Waldo Emerson, Joe Polis was one of three in Thoreau's pantheons of heroes, along with John Brown and Walt Whitman. Thank you, Anne. Thanks, Anne. <coughs> I'm Connie, obviously, and I just wanted to say hello and welcome you and thank you for coming. Uh, we have some DVD clips that we may be screening. There may be technical difficulties. We may not get to do that, but they're online. You can go online and at the American Evolution on YouTube and access the DVD clips. And those clips show Arnie Neptune, the uncle of James, uh, and Th Brad Dean, the Thoreau scholar, giving some depth and breadth to what we're presenting here tonight that lets you know that what we, these ideas are significant ideas and very real because Arnie really goes into the, 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 the connection of the native people that, that Thoreau had and sent and saw and that's why he came to Maine and spent time with the native people. And I'd like to dedicate this evening's performance to Arnie Neptune who is about to pass. He's a very dear friend and as I said uncle of James. So I'd like everyone to maybe spend a minute and just wish him well on his journey and um, just a treasured man. And also, I'd like to honor my, an my ancestors, James Finney Baxter and Percival P. Baxter, who are resting here in the Evergreen Cemetery. And it is, it is their vision and their action in their lives that sent me on the journey that allows me, has allowed me to discover this way of seeing the world from the indigenous perspective and the perspective of the mystic, the connection to the bigger whole. These men acted in office from their hearts and we're connected to a different paradigm. And that sent me on a journey to find out what they were resonating to. And I found the answer in 500 Indian nations. And then I discovered Henry David Thoreau, that he had discovered this, and that he actually saw this future that of, the, of our, all of humanity reconnecting to this place. So that's what this is about. And um, so I'll sit down now and let, um, oh, one thing I wanted to say is I'm going to read my part because this is a scholarly thesis that I'm presenting. I'm going to read my part so that I'm concise and accurate and the whole thing flows and I don't get off on some tangent, okay? So um, I'll start now. We are here today to touch on a couple of little known aspects of the life and works of Henry David Thoreau, American author and visionary. His lifelong fascination with the American Indian and his life-changing epiphany on Katahdin. I believe these aspects, once understood, will be significant for humanity's evolution of consciousness. In a, ve excuse me, in a few moments, no, we're not gonna screen. So we're not going to screen the video after, clips. I've already told the you about that. Mm -hmm. The simplest way to cut to the chase of what I'm driving at tonight is to say that we will be dressing, 
addressing the mystical nature of the universe. Quote, the universe is wider than our views of it, unquote, wrote Thoreau in the last chapter of Walden. This wider reality is the one we will be looking at. Why? Because I believe that humanity is about to take an evolutionary leap into seeing and experiencing this reality. Just as the transcendentalists, Thoreau and Emerson, did, and the mystics, visionaries, and indigenous peoples of the world do. In fact, Thoreau described himself as, quote, a mystic, transcendentalist, and a natural philosopher to boot. So, in the, in the normal course of events, we would have screened the film. But I'll go on now and say, today, we're going to take Thoreau the next step by looking at him, his life, and his work from a different perspective, from a future Thoreau envisioned looking back. In his writing, Thoreau alludes to the future, to the possible human, and the importance of the message carried by the arrowhead from the indigenous mind. We are going to show you a Thoreau and the Indian he experienced, give you some ideas to ponder, and suggest a synthesis from which we can all open to a larger reality and take the human potential up a notch to the place Thoreau dedicated his life to modeling. Many of the quotes you'll be hearing today in these readings are in the full length part two of the American Evolution, Voices of America series that's available here. So, have at it, gentlemen. Hmm. I am Henry, this is Joseph, and after a long day's paddling on the Allegash, uh, we briefly saw a moose. Joseph disappeared for an hour, came back covered in sweat and mosquitoes, but no moose. He will be preparing dinner, no potatoes either. I left them back in Old Town. So I'm not quite sure what he, but you know, he's, he's able to come up with an amazing meal in the middle of nowhere. It's one of the great abilities he has. I thank you for that, Joseph. As much as sportsmen go in pursuit of ducks and gunners of musquash and scholars of rare books and travelers of adventures and poets of ideas and all men of money, I go in search of arrowheads when the proper season comes around again. The larger pestles and axes may perchance grow scarce and be broken, but the arrowhead shall perhaps never cease to wing its way through the ages to eternity. It was originally winged but for a short flight, but still, to my mind's eye, it wings its way through the ages, bearing a message from the hand that shot it. They're not fossil bones, but as it were, fossil thoughts, forever reminding me of the mind that shaped them. I would fain know that I am treading in the tracks of human game, that I am on the trail of mind, and these little reminders never fail to set me right. There is scarcely a square rod of sand exposed in this neighborhood, but you may find on it stone arrowheads of an extinct race. Far back as that time seems, when men went armed with bows and pointed stones here, yet so numerous are the signs of it the finer particles of sand are blown away, and yet the arrowhead remains. The race is as clean gone from here as the sand is clean swept by the wind. Such are our antiquities. These were our predecessors. Why then make so great ado about the Roman and the Greek and neglect the Indian? We need not wander off with boys in our imaginations to Juan Fernandez to wonder at footprints in the sand there. Here is a print still more significant at our doors, the print of a race that has preceded us, and this the little symbol that nature has transmitted to us. 
Yes, this arrow-headed character is probably more ancient than any other. And to my mind, it has not been deciphered. Men should not go to New Zealand to write or think of Greece and Rome, nor more to New England. New earths, new themes expect us. Celebrate not the Garden of Eden, but your own. Thoreau made three excursions to the Maine woods where he hired Indian guides to study their ways. I narrowly watched his motions and listened attentively to his observations, for we had employed an Indian mainly that I might have the opportunity to study his ways. On his first excursion to Mount Katahdin in September of 1846, the Indian guide he hired, Louis Neptune, failed to appear. Fortunately, his descendant, James, has appeared tonight. Thoreau and his companions ended up climbing Katahdin without a guide. And on this climb, he experienced a life-changing epiphany. On Thoreau's second excursion to Maine, he hired Joe Attian, son of the governor, as his guide on a moose hunting expedition in 1853. And in 1857, on his last trip to Maine, he hired Joe Polis. Thoreau died five years later in 1862 after taking a trip to Minnesota where he also explored the Indian culture. The relationship that developed between Thoreau and Polis during his last Maine excursion was to solidify in Thoreau's mind the importance of the Indian experience. Thoreau had been fascinated by the Indian since childhood. Thoreau saw that the Indian could see what he could see. Thoreau, as a mystic and transcendentalist, resonated to an expanded reality. He possessed the ability to see and sense the spirit that is at the essence of all life. And from this vantage point, he could envision a society made up of the true human acting from a connectedness that is foreign to most people at this time. Why was Joe Polis one of three's, three of Thoreau's heroes? Because, as Brad Dean points out in the video, Joe exemplified Thoreau's dream of the synthesis of the mystical indigenous connection to nature to what I call the conscious loving universe with the worldly man who could function in modern times, exhibiting capabilities which I see as the emerging human, whose choices will take humanity closer to realizing our full potential as loving beings walking in balance. To me, this is the evolutionary leap of humanity. Thoreau saw and bemoaned the limitations of the modern society and he resonated to the expanded reality of the mystic and often experienced the natural world the way the Indian did. He dreamed of a future that would bridge these realities and Joe Polis symbolized this possibility. Thoreau saw a future in which humanity connects with its highest conscience and writes of this in civil disobedience. As Brad Dean says in the video, Thoreau writes, quote, that government is best which governs least. Carried out, it finally amounts to this. That government is best which governs not at all. And Brad continues, if you don't mind me putting a parenthesis to Henry David Thoreau, what you need to do is say, that government is best which governs not at all, because in such a government, all the citizens govern themselves. That's key. This is still Brad speaking. What Thoreau wants is self-governors. Everyone is their own king and governor and Congress and Senate. And you do not need laws to oppress you because you have a law inwardly that manifests itself in your conduct outwardly. I will venture to say that there is a direct link between humanity's expanded mystical connection to the universe and its access to its highest conscience. 
its divine nature, that the message carried to the future by the arrowhead is the possibility of life lived in alignment with the oneness of creation and the sacredness of all things. Concepts that lie at the foundation of indigenous cosmology as well as Eastern mysticism. In a little book called Mystics as a Force for Change, an East Indian named Ghost states, quote, mysticism proposes a revolution from above and by consciousness. To say technology is the grammar of the future is dangerous nonsense. Technique and transcendence must learn to work together. That would be the beginning of the total man and totality thinking. And the individuals who will most help humanity in the hour of crisis are those who recognize a will change from within as a step to a total change in our relationship with reality, the harmony of the whole. The issue is plain. What is the true nature of things and how do we embody it in our social living? End quote. That's this, this, this ghost fellow. Well, Albert Einstein states, no problem was ever solved in the same consciousness in which it was created. We have built a house of cards on a foundation of false assumptions that our logical minds have responded to and which have gotten us to where we are right now. Once we have come to grasp the correct, accurate information about the nature of the universe, our logical minds will take us to peace on earth. The Indian begins where we leave off and seems so much the divine and anything that fairly excites us or excites our admiration expands us. That's from uh, August 18, 1857 letter to Harrison Blake written shortly after Thoreau's final excursion to the Maine woods. Now Thoreau and Polis will speak for themselves. We will take you on a little adventure into the Maine woods. And this, is, this little set is after they've had a long day's paddle on the Allagash. The first man we saw on Indian Island was an Indian named Joseph Polis, whom my relative had known from a boy, and now addressed familiarly as Joe. He was dressing a deer skin in his yard. The skin was spread over a slanting log, and he was scraping it with a stick held by both hands. He was stoutly built, a little above the middle height, with a broad face and, as others said, perfect Indian features and complexion. His house was a two-story white one, with blinds, the best looking that I noticed there, and as good as an average one on a New England village street. It was surrounded by a garden and fruit trees, single corn stalks standing thinly amid the beans. He was one of the aristocracy. It appeared that he had represented his tribe at Augusta and also once at Washington, where he had met some Western chiefs. Also, he had called on Daniel Webster in Boston. We asked him if he knew any good Indian who would like to go into the woods with us, to which he answered, out of that strange remoteness in which the Indian ever dwells to the white man, me like to go myself, me want to get some moose, and kept on scraping the skin. Early the next morning, July 23rd, the stage called for us the Indian having breakfasted with us and already placed the baggage in the canoe to see how it would go. My companion and I each had a large knapsack as full as it would hold and we had two large India rubber bags which held our provision and utensils. As for the Indian, all the baggage he had beside his axe and gun was a blanket which he brought loose in his hand. However, he had laid in a store of tobacco and a new pipe for the excursion. Our Indian said that he was a doctor and could tell me some medicinal use for every plant I could show him. I immediately tried him. He said the inner bark of the aspen was good for sore eyes, and so with various plants, proving himself as good as his word. According to his account, he had acquired such knowledge in his youth from a wise old Indian with whom he associated and he lamented that the present generation of Indians had lost a good deal. J. 
just before night we saw a musquash. He did not say muskrat. The only one we saw in this voyage, swimming downward on the opposite side of the stream. The Indian, wishing to get one to eat, hushed us, saying, Stop, me call him. And sitting flat on the bank, he began to make a curious, squeaking, wiry sound with his lips, exerting himself considerably. I was greatly surprised, thought that I had at least got into the wilderness and that he was a wild man indeed to be talking to a musquash. I did not know which of the two was the strangest to me. He seemed suddenly to have quite forsaken humanity and gone over to the musquash side. The musquash, however, as near as I could see, did not turn aside. Though he may have hesitated a little, and the Indian said that he saw our, our fire. But it was evident that he was in the habit of calling Musquash to him as he said. An acquaintance of mine who was hunting down moose in the woods a month after this tells me that his Indian in this way repeatedly called the Musquash within reach of his paddle in the moonlight and struck at them. We carried, <coughs> excuse me, we carried round the falls just below on the west side. The rocks were on their edges and very sharp. The distance was about three-fourths of a mile. When we had carried over one load, the Indian returned by the shore and I by the path. And though I made no particular haste, I was nevertheless surprised to find him at the other end as soon as I. It was remarkable how easily he got along over the worst ground. He said to me, I take canoe and you take the rest. Suppose you can keep along with me? I thought that he meant, while he ran down the rapids, I should keep along the shore and be ready to assist him from time to time, as I had done before. But as the walking would be very bad, I answered, I suppose you will go too fast for me, but I will try. But I was to go by the path, he said. This, I thought, would not help the matter. I should have so far to go to get to the riverside when he wanted me. But neither was this what he meant. He was proposing a race over the carry and asked me if I thought I could keep along with him by the same path, adding that I must be pretty smart to do it. As his load, the canoe, would be but much the heaviest and bulkiest, though the simplest, I thought that I ought to be able to do it, and I said that I would try. So I proceeded to gather up the gun, axe, paddle, kettle, frying pan, plates, dippers, carpets, etc., etc., etc. And while I was thus engaged, he threw me his cowhide boots. What? Are these in the bargain? I asked. Oh, yeah, said he. But before I could make a bundle of my load, I saw him disappearing over a hill with a canoe on his head. So, hastily scraping the various articles together, I started on the run and immediately went by him in the bushes. But I had no longer left no sooner left him out of sight in a rocky hollow than the greasy plates, dippers, etc., took to themselves wings, and while I was employed in gathering them up again, he went by me. But hastily pressing the sooty kettle to my side, I started once more, and soon passing him again, I saw him no more on the carry. I do not mention this as anything of a feat, for it was but poor running on my part, and he was obliged to move with great caution for fear of breaking his canoe, as well as his neck. When he made his appearance, puffing and panting like myself, in answer to my inquiries where he had been, he said, locks cut him feet, and laughing added, oh, me love to play sometimes. He said that he and his companions, when they came to carries several miles long, used to try who would get over first, each perhaps with a canoe on his head. I bore the sign of the kettle on my brown linen sack for the rest of the voyage. He complimented me on my paddling, saying that I paddled just like anyone, and giving me an Indian name which meant great paddler. I observed that I should like to go to school to him to learn his language, living on the Indian island the while. Could not that be done? Oh yeah, he replied, good many do so. I asked how, how long he thought it would take. He said, one week. I told him that in this voyage I would tell him all I knew and he should tell me all he knew, to which he readily agreed. 
I was surprised to hear him say that he liked to go to Boston, New York, Philadelphia, etc., etc., that he would like to live there. But then, as if relenting a little, when he thought what a poor figure he would make there, he added, I suppose I live in New York. I be poorest hunter, I expect. He understood very well both his superiority and his inferiority to the whites. I asked him how he guided himself in the woods. He replied, great difference between me and the white man. It appeared as if the sources of information were so various that he did not give a distinct conscious attention to any one, and so could not readily refer to any when questioned about it. But he found his way very much as an animal does. Perhaps what is commonly called instinct in the animal in this case is merely a sharpened and educated sense. Often, when an Indian says, I don't know, in regard to the route he is to take, he does not mean what a white man would be by those words, for the Indian instinct may tell him still as much as the most confident white man knows. He does not carry things in his head, nor remember the route exactly like a white man but relies on himself at the moment. Not having experienced the need of the other sort of knowledge, all labeled and arranged, he has not acquired it. The next day, the Indian told me their name for the, for, for the phosphorescent light I had seen in the night, Artusako, and on my inquiring concerning the will-o'-wisp and the like phenomena, he said that his folks sometimes saw fires passing along at various heights, even as high as the trees, and making a noise. I was prepared after this to hear of the most startling and unimagined phenomena witnessed by his folks. They are abroad at all hours and seasons, in scenes so unfrequented by white men. Nature must have made a thousand revelations to them, which are still secrets to us. It suggested, too, that the same experience always gives birth to the same sort of belief or religion. One revelation has been made to the Indian, another to the white man. I have much to learn of the Indian, nothing of the missionary. I'm not sure, but that all that would tempt me to teach the Indian my religion would be his promise to teach me his. A scientific explanation, as it is called, would have been altogether out of place there. That is for pale daylight. Science, with its retorts, would have put me to sleep. It was the opportunity to be ignorant that I improved. It suggested to me that there was something to be seen if one had eyes. It made a believer of me more than before. I believed that the woods were not tenantless, but chock full of honest spirits as good as myself any day. Not an empty chamber in which chemistry was left to work alone, but an inhabited house and for a few moments I enjoyed fellowship with them. As we drew near to Old Town, I asked Polis if he was not glad to get home again, but there was no relenting to his wildness. He said, it makes no difference to me where I am. We stopped for an hour at Polis's house, where my companion shaved with his razor, which he pronounced in very good condition. Mrs. P. wore a hat and had a silver brooch on her breast, but she was not introduced to us. The house was roomy and neat. This was the last that I saw of Joe Polis. We took the last train and reached Bangor that night. This experience with Polis was so significant that Thoreau would not immediately publish his account for fear of offending Polis. On his deathbed, Thoreau's last words were Indian and moose. Thoreau and the Indian transcend the experience of the everyday man. Thoreau saw salvation in this transcendence. It allowed him to see the human potential. He was not, however, a stranger to the shadow side of the Indian nor of the white man. He had an extraordinary insight into the human condition, its limitations, and its possibilities. 
His dream was to inspire his readers, the human race, to a higher place. The truth will set us free. And each race must acknowledge the dichotomy of its light and its shadow. Thoreau expresses this dichotomy in the following passage. What an evidence it is, after all, of civilization or of a capacity for improvement that savages like our Indians, who in their protracted wars stealthily slay men, women, and children without mercy, what a wonderful evidence it is, I say, of their capacity for improvement that even they can enter into the most formal compact or treaty of peace, burying the hatchet, etc., etc., and treating with each other with as much consideration as the most enlightened states. You would say that they had a genius for diplomacy as well as for war. Consider that Iroquois torturing his captive, and now behold him in the council chamber, where he meets the representatives of the hostile nation to treat of peace, conducting with such perfect dignity and decorum, betraying such a sense of justness. These savages are equal to us civilized men in their treaties, and I fear not essentially worse in their wars. Every race, every human, has a light and a shadow side. We cannot burden anyone with the idea that he has no shadow. Each race has passed through dark hours in our evolution. Without rose-colored glasses, Thoreau could see beyond our limitations to the higher truths because he shared a reality with the Indian from which he could see possibilities. Joe will now read Thoreau's writings that indicate this transcendence. We talk of civilizing the Indian, but that is not the name for his improvement. If we could listen but for an instant to the chant of the Indian muse, we should understand why he will not exchange his savage, savageness for civilization by the wary independence and aloofness of his dim forest life, life he preserves his intercourse with his native gods and is admitted from time to time to a rare and peculiar society with nature he has glances of starry recognition to which our saloons are strangers the steady illumination of his genius dim only because distant is like the faint but satisfying light of the stars compared with the dazzling but ineffectual and short-lived blaze of candles. We would not always be soothing and taming nature, breaking the hoss and the ox, but sometimes ride the wild horse and chase the buffalo. The Indian's intercourse with nature is at least such as admits of the greatest independence of each. The white man comes pale as the dawn, with a load of thought, with a slumbering intelligence as a fire raked up, knowing well what he knows, not guessing but calculating, strong in community, yielding obedience to authority, of experienced race, of a wonderful, wonderful common sense, dull but capable, slow but persevering, severe but just of little humor, but genuine, a laboring man despising game and sport, building a house that endures a framed house. He buys the Indian's moccasins and baskets, then buys his hunting grounds, and at length forgets where he is buried and plows up his bones. And here town records, old, tattered, time-worn, weather-stained chronicles, contain the Indian sachem marks, perchance an arrow or a beaver, and the, f and the few fatal words by which he deeded his hunting grounds away. He comes with a list of ancient Saxon, Norman, and Celtic names, and strews them up and down this river, Framingham, Sudbury, Bedford, Carlisle, Chelmsford, and this is New Angleland, and these are the new West Saxons, whom the red man call not English or English, but Yankees. And so at least, so at last, they are known for Yankees. 
The savage is far-sighted. His eye, like the poet's, doth glance from heaven to earth, from earth to heaven. He looks far into futurity, wandering, wandering as familiarly through the land of spirits as the civilized man through his woodlot or pleasure grounds. His life is practical poetry, a perfect epic. The earth is his hunting ground. He lives suns and winters. The sun is his timepiece. He journeys to it rising or its setting. To the abode of winter, or the land whence the summer comes. He never listens to the thunder, but he is reminded of the great spirit. It is his voice. To him, the lightning is less terrible than it is sublime, the rainbow less beautiful than it is wonderful, the sun less warm than it is glorious. The savage dies and is buried. He sleeps with his forefathers and before many winters his dust returns to dust again, and his body is mingled with the elements. The civilized man can scarce sleep even in his grave. Not even there are weary at rest, nor do the wicked cease from troubling. The savage may be, and often is, a sage. Our Indian is more of a man than an inhabitant of a city. He lives as a man. He thinks as a man, he dies as a man. The latter, it is true, is more learned. Learning is art's creature, but it is not essential to the perfect man. It cannot educate. The true man of science will have a rare Indian wisdom and will know nature better by his finer organization. He will smell, taste, see, hear, feel, better than other men, his will be a deeper and finer experience. The charm of the Indian to me is that he stands free and unconstrained in nature, is her inhabitant, not her guest, and wears her easily and gracefully. But the civilized man has the habits of the house. His house is a prison in which he finds himself oppressed and confined, not sheltered and protected. He walks as if he sustained the roof, he carries his arms as if the walls would fall in and crush him. And his feet remember the cellar beneath. His muscles are never relaxed. It is rare that he overcomes the house and learns to sit at home in it, and roof and floor and walls support themselves as the sky and trees and earth. For the Indian, there is no safety but in the plow. If he would not be pushed into the Pacific, he must seize hold of a plow tail and let go of his bow and arrow, his fish spear and rifle. This, the only Christianity that will save him. His fate says sternly to him, forsake the hunter's life and enter into the agricultural, the second state of man. Root yourselves a little deeper in the soil if you would continue to be the occupants of the country. But I confess, I have no little sympathy with the Indians and hunter men they seem to me a distinct and equally respectable people, born to wander and to hunt, and not to be inoculated with the twilight civilization of the white man. The Indian, perchance, has not made up his mind to some things which the white man has consented to. He has not, in all respects, stooped so low. And hence, <coughs> and hence though he too loves food and warmth, he draws his tattered blankets around him and follows his fathers rather than barter his birthright. He dies and no doubt his genius judges well for him, but he is not worsted in the fight. He is not destroyed. He only migrates beyond the Pacific to more spacious and happier hunting grounds. A race of hunters can never withstand the inroads of a race of husbandmen. The latter burrow in the night into their country and undermine them. And even if the hunter is brave enough to resist, his game is timid and has already fled. The rifle alone would never exterminate it, but the plow is a more fatal weapon. It wins the country inch by inch and holds all it gets. 
But this points to a distinction between the civilized man and the savage. And no doubt, they have designs on us make, in making the life of a civilized people an institution in which the life of the individual is to, to a great extent absorbed in order perchance to preserve and perfect the race. But I wish to show at, at what a sacrifice this advantage is obtained and to suggest that we may possibly so live as to secure all the advantage without suffering any of the disadvantage. I think myself in a wilder country and a little nearer to primitive times when I read in the old books which spell the word savages with an L, salvages, reminding me of the derivation of the word from silver. There is some of the wild woods and its bristling branches still left in their language. The savages they describe are really salvages, men of the woods. These remind us that not only for strength, but for beauty, the poet must from time to time travel the logger's path and the Indian's trail to drink at some new and more bracing fountain of the muses far in the recesses of the wilderness. If then we would indeed restore mankind by truly Indian, botanic, magnetic, or natural means, let us first be as simple and well as nature ourselves, dispel the clouds which hang over our own brows, and take up a little life into our pores. Do not stay to be an overseer of the poor, but endeavor to become one of the worthies of the world. Thoreau's political life, his life in society, his role as an author, exemplify the mystical connection to the universe. Thoreau was the probable human. His ability to see and experience an expanded reality drove his actions on a day-to-day -day basis. He acted according to his inner knowing, his conscience and changed the world through modeling and communicating what he saw and resonated to. He dreamt of a nation of individuals operating in freedom that would actualize on earth the highest human potential and the power of the universe. Thoreau desperately wanted the world to see what he could see and believed that one day we would. It was only a matter of humanity waking up to its true nature. On the title page of Walden, Thoreau writes, I do not propose to write an ode to dejection, but to brag as lustily as Chanticleer in the morning, if only to wake my neighbors up. My last page is missing. Oh. I, for one, believe that Thoreau, the futurist, saw, sensed, the evolution of consciousness that humanity was to undergo, the merging of the inner and outer self, and knew he was a front runner. It's time for the vision of Thoreau, for the cosmology of the indigenous peoples, for the heart of humanity, and the true destiny of America to become actualized through our day-to-day -day choices as we bring peace on earth, heaven on earth. New earths, new themes expect us. Thank you. Thank you. Joseph here has some wonderful oh, right. Joe's artifacts. Gonna, no, but Joe's going to sing that. a song. I know that. <laughs> Joseph has some. Don't miss having a look at the wonderful artifacts there and T-shirts and things that Joseph has brought down. And he is going to close the show with a healing song from his, which is traditional among his people. Joe. James. James. Now we're James. Neptune. Going to share <laughs> with you. I run the Penobscot Nation Museum. I am both from the uh, Penobscot and Passamaquoddy. My father was full-blooded Penobscot. My mother was full-blooded Passamaquoddy. Met during World War II over in Hawaii. 
My father was a fighter down in the islands and my mother was a cook for the Women's Army Corps. And so I'm one of six. And uh, we all sort of seem like the same type of spiritual people, all my brothers and sisters, different from a few others. But uh, I wanna sing this song. It's a song that's been passed down from generation to generation. Uh, during World War II, they used this song to, uh, uh, to sort of uh, cleanse the spirit of the, of the people and uh, of, the hunt, of the soldiers that, that were going out to war. And they were also uh, drummed, drummed back in when they, when they got home. We had a 100% of age male population going to the armed services during World War II. Uh, we even had some men underage sneak in and some w women went in also. So uh, we were pretty fortunate. We only lost two uh, I'm amongst all, all, all the guys who did, who did go in. And so uh, this song is a healing song. Uh, it's called the Medicine Man song, but, but I uh, uh, started uh, singing it probably about two or three years ago. We had an elder who was, who was looking to find a, uh, an apprentice to, to learn some of the old songs. And so uh, uh, he checked a few of the young people and the young people just didn't have the perseverance to, to really outlast and, or, or to do it and stuff or just to even show up. So he came into the museum several times before complaining and whining that he couldn't find anyone. And, and so finally I said, well, what about me? And he says, well, yeah, what about you? And so um, from that day on, I became his apprentice. And throughout that fall and throughout that winter, I, uh, I became his apprentice and I started learning some of the old traditional songs from him. And uh, he, uh, he taught me a lot. And uh, so we worked throughout the fall and winter, laughing, singing, drumming, telling old stories, uh, because I'd known this man. My, my whole life and uh, and so uh, summer was coming the American Folk Festival was coming to Bangor and since we were a part of the, uh, uh, the the main arts foundation I think it's called uh, through their apprenticeship program that's how I that's how I learned so we said well you have to come and come to it and show what you learned so it says okay I'll, I'll come just as long as you you lead I'll I'll follow. And then um, uh, we had to get a drum. So um, he brought the fixings to a drum and it seemed like we just could never find a time to uh, build a drum. And so one of my weekends out uh, went antiquing. I love antiquing. <laughs> I was surprised when I was down the Cabot Mill where I was supposed to do a, we did that performance piece last night down there. and. And I turned in on, on the wrong side of the building to get to that place and I saw antiques, <laughs> flea market. <laughs> and I knew I was too late, but, but I was there for the performance and I got my fill today. So I uh, found this drum in an antique store. It was probably someone's drum project, someone who uh, just didn't feel um, about the drum as, as they should have. Maybe they, maybe they, it just wasn't their time. Because all things come in, in certain times, you know, and, and, and uh, you'll only see things when it's time to see them. you only meet people when it's time to meet them. And so uh, the moose is made out of, uh, the, the drum is made out of the moose hide. And uh, he had a turtle on his drum. And uh, uh, I decided to paint something that came from my past years of drawing and dreaming and ancestral knowledge being being passed on through me so this is this is the image that I drew this is one that I painted uh, most people say that whatever you do if you do affects everyone else you're sort of like that pebble that's thrown in the water and it ripples out you become that that changing force sometimes which I like to do sometimes I, I, I want to help people heal and that's why I like playing this song because it's a healing song. And so, uh, what it shows is, of course, our our cyclic type of, of uh, uh, lifestyle. 
Uh, we have uh, the east, the south, the west, and the north. These are the four physical directions. There are four spiritual directions too. I'll let you know over them when it's time. <laughs> but but right now, um, this tells a story about the uh, four physical directions here on Earth that we all that we all know. Uh, uh, each one is a, a part of the cycle of man. Also, uh, you got you got childhood when you're born. You got uh, youth when you're growing up. You're growing stronger. This is the sun when it's at its highest. That's why its color is red. Blue is the color of water. This is when you become an adult, and you have to look introspectively into who you are and what you need to do. How how well balanced you are in this world. And then of course it leads on to. To your senior senior years, your elder years, hopefully wiser, wiser than than you were in, in the beginning. So this is a, a a story of when you become balanced like that. You know all the fine qualities and, and uh, virtues of, of those four directions. You're able to find a doorway, a portal, so to speak, uh, to go from the physical world into the spiritual world. And uh, when you uh, go pass through that door, you become a light being. And when you become a light being, you, you're able to travel throughout the universe to seek knowledge, to bring back to help yourself, bring back to help your family, to come back to help your people. And then you realize that all people are your people. And so then you uh, try to help all people. So this healing song, uh, I want to ripple out to all four directions, and that's why on each direction um, you'll see on the side the yellow has the yellow ripples, and then I have the red ripples, and the uh, blue ripples, and I have the uh, white ripples. So this, this music, uh, this resonance is, is, is uh, uh, rippling out to all four directions. So when I sing this song, I tell people to think of people within their family who need healing. A lot of people need healing. There's a lot of uh, physical, uh, mental, and spiritual sickness out there that people have to work their way through. And there's a lot of war-minded people too, and we have to get rid of, rid of a lot of that. We have to become a peaceful nation of people. We have to understand one another. And we'll never understand if we don't talk to, to uh, one another and uh, show who we are from our heart. So this song is uh, is from my heart. It's from my people. It's from my ancestors. It's uh, it uh, comes from a long, long time in the past, and it comes to this time where it uh, echoes out to all four corners uh, for healing. So I have a lot of friends, my uncle especially, who could use healing. But I know with time that we all have. It's our time to go, and I've been looking towards that time. I know it's his time and he's getting weaker, but he's had a good life. He's met a lot of great people, you know, and a lot of people really uh, respect him and adore him because he is a likable, lovable man. My Uncle Arnie. I call him Uncle Man. So I'll sing this song to uh, all the people everywhere. Doesn't matter what color you are. Doesn't matter how tall you are, doesn't matter how, what size you are. Uh, so I wanted to go to all peoples all over the earth because uh, a lot of healing is needed everywhere. So we'll start off the song and uh, hopefully it'll help some people out. And uh, if not many, at least a few, hopefully some of you that are listening, maybe it'll, it'll uh, tear off those blinders that some of you may have or may not have and look at things from a wider perspective because I, I'm trying to give you my perspective. And uh, if you can look from my side, maybe um, we can become friends. We can get to know one another. no <clears throat>
Hallelujah.